Lagerfeld's legacy as a designer is phenomenal. The amount of places and brands that he's gone into and rejuvenated. He really has always created designs for the moment. You can't really go through all the different things that Karl Lagerfeld does superbly. You know, he is a superb colorist. He's got an incredible eye for silhouettes. I think the fact that he can design for multiple different fashion houses at a single time and create things that have an incredible signature tied both to him and to the fashion house is remarkable. You can't identify what it is that makes it Karl Lagerfeld, but you immediately know it's Karl Lagerfeld. He's one of the kind of few sort of renaissance men that we still have left, certainly in fashion. It seems that he can do everything. Karl Lagerfeld was born in 1933. Um, there's a lot of controversy around that. Karl Lagerfeld himself has um, made himself younger on many occasions. Um, generally, he's, he's varied his birth date between 1935 and 1938. Um, but baptismal records have been found to confirm that he was born in 1933 in Hamburg. He was born into an upper-middle-class family his father had made a lot of money from importing condensed milk into Germany. During the war, when Hitler's rise to power, they moved to a rural area, and uh, Karl said that this really meant that he didn't have uh, a close sort of personal experience of wartime. Fascinatingly, Lagerfeld moved to Paris when he was 14 years old with the blessing of his parents. He was very sort of ambitious in that sense. He'd been on a trip to visit there and thought, well, this is for me. I think that really gives you another glimmer into the kind of personality he became. He studied at the Lycée Montaigne, which was, a, uh, by his own admission, a rather unserious school where he studied drawing, and then he moved to study at the Chambre Syndicale. He wasn't in the same class as Yves Saint Laurent, but he was studying in the school at the same time, and the, the two became friends. And really, he was drawn into this whole world of, of Paris and the golden age of haute couture, which was the early 1950s, late 1940s. It was following Dior's new look. It was following the establishment of houses like Pierre Balmain. Um, Balenciaga uh, was kind of revolutionizing the fashion world. And by 1954, Chanel had returned. Um, so really, the, there was this incredibly energetic scene in, in France. In 1954, Karl Lagerfeld entered the Walmart Secretariat Prize. This was a prize run by the Walmart company uh, for the kind of brightest, newest talent. And Lagerfeld won in the coat section, interestingly, Yves Saint Laurent won in the other category. And the prize for this was that Balmain would make your jackets, your coats. And noticing such incredible talent, he then was offered a design role at the mere age of 22, working for Pierre Balmain. It was his first entrance into the world of haute couture and really his, his first win. In 1958, Lagerfeld left Balmain and went to Jean Patou. And at this time, he was designing under the name Roland Karl. His work there wasn't tremendously well received. It was very up and down. Um, with a lot of it, it was because Karl was trying to be quite radical. There was a very interesting moment when Carrie Donovan, um, who was working at the New York Times at the time, said that Karl's collection looked like very saleable and elegant, ready to wear, but not like a couture collection. And the interesting thing for me is that that's really underscoring the direction that Karl Lagerfeld is going to go in. He's going to move away from this fuddy-duddy, from this antiquated world of haute couture, and he's really going to make a name for himself in ready-to-wear, in this, this new, fast-paced, exciting, very buzzy world of ready-to-wear. After working for Jean Patou, Lagerfeld left and became a freelance designer, working for many different labels, which some he's gone on to have a very long and storied history with. After leaving Jean Patou, he, he freelanced for a number of different design houses. He freelanced for Mario Valentino, he freelanced for Repetto, and he went to work for um, Tiziani in, in Italy. And they were um, 
kind of a, quite a young couture house. The, the founder um, was a, an American man, and they would dress people like like Elizabeth Taylor, like Gina Lola Brigida. So they were quite a high profile house for Lagerfeld to be working under. In 1966, Lagerfeld became the main designer for Chloe after working with them in a freelance capacity before that. This is a really, really important moment in his career because he really was able to take a brand on and transform it in many ways. Chloe was established in the 50s, but by the mid-60s when Lagerfeld joined them, it was really a point when ready-to-wear was, was expanding across. There were lots of ready-to-wear designers emerging in Paris. Um, Yves Saint Laurent started his own ready-to-wear line, Rive Gauche, in 1966, and they began to be referred to as créateurs, um, which was a way to, to kind of distinguish between ready-to-wear designers and haute couturiers. They started to present their clothes on the catwalk. It's really about this kind of, this industry emerging of mass-manufactured, ready-to-wear clothes in Paris um, that ultimately would overtake the haute couture and become much more important. Um, and what Lagerfeld very cleverly did was position himself at the very forefront of that. Lagerfeld continued to collaborate with a diverse range of brands and created groundbreaking designs for Fendi. Cole's working with Fendi had been actually since the mid-60s, but in 72, their relationship was really set in stone. And what is still going in terms of their relationship began. The way in which he transformed Fendi is really, really interesting. They were known for their fur and leather goods, but it's really where the fur uh, is really where he transformed things. They had been catering to a much more traditional uh, clientele, and Lagerfeld came in and came up with this phrase, fun furs, which is actually the double F in the logo that stands today. And what he did was say, well, you know, fur can be a really transformative fabric. It can be treated in the way that we treat silks or, you know, wool yarns. He really said, you know, this doesn't have to be treated in the way that we expect. Fendi allowed him to, to really shake up the world of furs. He ripped out the linings. He was using poor fur like rabbit and squirrel, dyeing them incredibly vibrant colours. And really, it's, it's been about challenging perceptions of fur. Lagerfeld's work with Chloe in the 1970s revolutionised the worlds of fashion and perfume. He was at Chloe and was enormously successful at Chloe. He'd established a house style at Chloe. There wasn't really anything there when he, when he went into Chloe. It's really all Lagerfeld. When there was all the kind of economic uncertainty in the 1970s, Lagerfeld was proposing these kind of pastoral dresses, these dresses based around Victorian clothes, around Edwardian clothes, around historical styles that people hadn't seen before. Um, and women really fought to have those dresses. Gabby Aguihaw, who, um, who owned Chloe and, and passed away last year, was really emphatic about the fact that, that women were incredibly, in, incredibly excited by these clothes that Carl Lagerfeld was doing because they didn't look like clothes that anyone else was doing. In 1975, Lagerfeld launched the perfume Chloe, and that was something that he really, really enjoyed. Uh, he stated often that perfume is a real passion for him. The Chloe perfume in 1975, with you know being based around a whole bunch of flowers, it's like it's, it's an incredibly intoxicating, very heavy floral perfume. Is really tied in with that kind of femininity that, that Lagerfeld really made his own at Chloe, that he really made a, a, a trademark at Chloe. Um, it's also notable because it's the first time that a, that a, a ready-to-wear house has launched a perfume that isn't by the founder of the house. The way that Lagerfeld works is that he, um, he asks for a royalty on sales of the perfume, which is, he's a, an incredibly savvy businessman. I think that's something that's um, frequently overlooked in, in the way that Lagerfeld works. He's incredibly clever. In 1983, Karl Lagerfeld made fashion history when he became design director at Chanel. In 1983, Coco Chanel had been dead for 10 years, and the, the Wertheimer family who owned Chanel were looking at ways to revive the house. Um, the one designer they felt had never drawn on Chanel's legacy was Karl Lagerfeld, and he actually turned down the offer of, of Chanel three times before finally accepting it. 
Now he says himself he was he was really employed to overhaul and transform the brand. Now whether that was the intention, it's something he's really really achieved. So what he did was take the notes of Chanel, the sort of motifs, the camellia, the chain, the quilting, and transformed it to something that was so relevant. I think that's an interesting thing. This one piece will make 52 layers. Watch on mobile devices or the big screen. All for free. No subscription required. He showed his first collection in 1983 and it was poorly received by the press, which is interesting because if you look back at it now, you can see that um, it, it's the kind of tentative first steps towards what, what would later become a, a, a revolution in terms of a designer reviving a dead house. And that's what he goes on to do throughout the 1980s. Lagerfeld is ripping apart the Chanel suit, pairing it with denim, pairing it with leather. You know, he uses all of these motifs that Chanel created, but he uses them in very irreverent ways. You know, the whole idea of, of combining a Chanel suit jacket with a pair of, you know, Y-front underpants on a woman is, is quite shocking. Chanel was still creating those little tweed suits, very, very sensible, with a skirt line just below the knee. What Lagerfeld did straight away was to hack two feet off them, so they were crotch length, um, to widen the shoulders, to really make Chanel move with the times, while at, at the same time kind of ensuring that it stays alive. There's this whole idea that, that you know, if Lagerfeld hadn't done what he'd done to Chanel, then it would have gone to the dogs, it would have gone to the doldrums. And now we don't know the, the precise figures because it's a privately owned company, but it's generally estimated to be the, the most valuable luxury goods house in the world. And that's completely down to Lagerfeld, it's completely down to, to what Karl Lagerfeld does. just as you know a year after he's taken over Chanel he launches his own brand label um, which is fascinating that he found the kind of time and headspace to do so I think that really kind of sums up his ambition and dedication so Lagerfeld has said often that he does not feel that lower end market endeavors absolutely will not harm his brand at all and so in doing that, you know, he was the first person to collaborate with H&M, to do Karl Lagerfeld H&M as a line. And it sold out so, so quickly, which he was obviously thrilled about. You know, that was something that was a real mark of success. He ended up selling it to, in the early 2000s, to Tommy Hilfiger. In 2002, Lagerfeld designed for Chanel the costumes for Callus Forever. It was really well received and felt that they very much suited the character. Lagerfeld has worked with some of the most famous women in fashion, music and film. So he's designed for celebrities' tours such as Madonna and then also designed for Kylie Minogue's Showgirl tour. And I think, you know, just taking those two personalities as a real synergy with uh, Lagerfeld and the work he does. The kind of move between different models of, you know, Inez de la Frissange, Claudia Schiffer, uh, in the 90s there was Stella Tennant, um, then there was Cara Delevingne, now Kendall Jenner. When you look at those people, when you look at that kind of trajectory, each one of them, in a sense, epitomises that particular moment. I think it's about Karl Lagerfeld being connected to, to the kind of fashion identity of, of a particular point in time. Um, Inez de la Frissange was the face of the 80s. Claudia Schiffer became, alongside the other supermodels, emblematic of a certain period in fashion. Of, of, uh, and. I feel like Cole stamping his ownership on her, stamping Chanel's ownership on Claudia Schiffer. I think that really shows uh, so much about Lagerfeld and the way in which he very much utilises these models. And he also does this with actresses and personalities such as Kirsten Stewart, Willow Smith, 
marrying courtyards. When they reach a certain point in their career, when they reach kind of a, a peak in their career, is when they become associated with Chanel because they're again they're kind of representing that time. It's interesting with Chanel, of course, because th there's such kind of longevity to Chanel's style. Which means that you, you can kind of latch on to the particular moment because as long as you're always referencing that Chanel style, there will always be kind of a permanence to it. Um, and maybe that's why Lagerfeld can jump from these different themes and from these different kind of inspirational women because there's always the grounding point of Chanel. There's always the style of Chanel that will give it a certain permanence. The other thing that's great about his vision for Chanel is that it's all-encompassing. You know, Lagerfeld, since the 1980s, has shot the Chanel campaigns as well. Um, you know, he designs the clothes, he shoots the campaign. He says, you know, looking through the lens is what he does every day in his work. So it's a natural extension of his practice. And so he takes all the advertising campaigns for Chanel, he takes the pictures. But he also does lots and lots of fashion editorial work. Unbelievably, that he has time to do these things. He has a very close relationship with German Vogue, uh, shooting often. Under Lagerfeld, Chanel's shows became the most unique and creative in fashion. When Lagerfeld's kind of envisaging these shows, um, he's talked previously about them and said that the, the ideas for them have come to him during dreams. You really can see a certain sense of theatre emerging in, in the staging of Chanel's shows. When you walk into a Chanel show, you've no idea what you're going to see. You don't know if it's going to be a, a kind of minute flower garden that will only sit 200 people or a vast brasserie that's been recreated in every single possible detail that will seat 3,000. There's a certain depth to that vision um, and also to the fact that it's then reflected in the clothes. It's, the, it's not just a kind of empty backdrop for the clothing. Those sets for me are the most interesting when Logfeld is using them to make a comment about something. So for instance, when he created a supermarket, uh, he was talking about the kind of commodification of fashion, um, the commodification of culture, when he created um, an art gallery, when other designers were scrambling to collaborate with artists, Karl Lagerfeld created an art gallery and filled it with recreations of artworks, but with a Chanel twist. It's not just about interpreting a suit in a quilted bag. It's so much more than that. And Karl Lagerfeld is the person that's made it more than that. He's really interesting in sort of creating that Instagram moment that is talked about often in the sense that, that then get this image gets impressed around the world. And I think it's something he's really mindful of when creating these kind of spectacles. Now into his 80s, Karl Lagerfeld exhibits no signs of slowing down. Lagerfeld has said that he's got a, a contract for life at Chanel um, and that he would never retire. But I think what he's actually done in, from working tirelessly at Chanel for working there so long and establishing it uh, so thoroughly at, at kind of the, the pinnacle of fashion is he's ensured that it will continue. I think Lagerfeld realises that the work he's doing at Chanel will probably be his legacy, that the work he's doing at Chanel will be the stuff that people look back on in a hundred years' time. The interesting thing for me when you're looking at the, the Windsor 2016 Chanel Ready to Wear show is that, in a sense, it brings you right back to the Rue Cambon. It brings you right back to Lagerfeld's first haute couture show in January 1983, but it's supersized. It's, instead of it being in the Rue Cambon, it's in the Grand Palais, and they've recreated the Rue Cambon, but they've created a Rue Cambon that can seat 3,000 people front row. Everyone was sat front row in that show, and the idea being to give... In, in that vast, spectacular space, the kind of intimacy of old-school haute couture, of that old-school haute couture that Logfell was trained in and that he debuted in when he, he showed that first Chanel show. The most recent Cruise collection was shown in Cuba. Once again, it, it's really fascinating, this decision, you know, just as Barack Obama has made his first official visit as the President of the United States, you have this Chanel show going on. All in all, it was a really celebrated spectacle.
I think the legacy of Cole will be the, the incredible body of work that he's produced. And perhaps more than garments, what Karl Lagerfeld's legacy will be is this spectacular revival of the fashion house. It will be creating this blueprint that people still try to replicate even today in, in terms of taking um, an established name, a known name, and reviving it to make it completely relevant and completely contemporary. And really that's Karl Lagerfeld's legacy, is that he's shown them the way to go and that every other fashion house now follows it. That's always what he's kind of done. He's pushed the boundaries and created something that people weren't really expecting. Do I think Karl Lagerfeld will carry on until he dies? I think Karl Lagerfeld is a man of his word, and I suspect he will. If, if he still feels like he has something relevant to contribute to the fashion conversation, which I'm sure he has, then he'll continue as long as he can.